Welcome to the Tiger Interview. How's it going, everyone? I hope you're having a great day, whether you're driving, working out, or relaxing and catching up on your shows. Today, I'm interviewing Joe Torval of Blast Motion, where we talk about effective evaluation of players, the key metric to finding out the potential speed of a hitter, and how choosing a showcase can be narrowed down to this one simple idea. Thanks, subscribe, write a review, enjoy. Welcome back to another edition of the Tiger Interview Series. Today we have Joe Torville of Blast Motion, and this is going to be a special episode um, just from a technology standpoint, but more importantly, um, how we got connected was through Twitter. And when you think about community and you think about conversation, Twitter is where it's at. And I did not know Joe until about three months ago, two months ago, and it literally seems like it's the conversation just keeps on rolling and it's a lot about technology, about what's happening in current events. And today um, I wanted to jump into this conversation with um, a tweet thread that we created. Um, obviously he has a mutual friend with is John Muscott, who is our account, um, our account representative who helps us with blast motion with the tigers. Um, but before we jump in, Joe, thank you so much for giving your time because I know that it is extremely valuable when you're dealing with technology and you're constantly talking with customers, figuring out the marketing space, and then also um, talking with showcase companies. So first off, thank you. And I want you to do a proper intro and give us a little bit of background about yourself. No, I appreciate it. I kind of figured we were going to jump on one of these at some point the way we're interacting on Twitter. So no, but uh, no, my name is Joe Torville. Uh, I am the account manager for event partners and strategic partners at Blast Motion. Uh, so basically that is any kind of like third party scouting services, event companies, showcase companies, anything that's not really like team oriented. Um, and when I start, say manage, like I onboard all these guys and I kind of act as like a consultant on how to capture the data, organize the data, maybe consult them on distributing the data and just kind of like finding ways to capture data in events that are kind of organized or kind of like tailor made to how they want to do it, um, which is pretty cool. All these guys have different models and different resources and a lot of these guys scale pretty high because events are just running so fast, especially with like PBR. But yeah, no, it's been great. I've been at Blast Motion pretty close to, uh, man, I can't even tell anymore, maybe a year and a half. I was gonna say two years. Yeah, <laughs> COVID, I mean, you just have no idea. Like, well, it's COVID. You don't, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, like, it's just like, it seems like time flies. I, I was texting one of my buddies. I was like, Hey, um, Shawnee and I are ready for dinner for tomorrow. Let's go get, we're going to go to a steakhouse. And he's like, bro, it's, it's, it's Saturday. You're in today's Thursday. I, I thought like, oh, Tuesday crap. was Thursday this week. I, don't <laughs> lie. I, thought, I thought Tuesday was Thursday this week. So, or that was last week. I guess one was, yeah. So um, funny you mentioned uh, Moscot though. I, I joke around or we joke around that I think the best contribution I've had to Blast so far is uh, meeting John Moscott and getting him into Blast. So <laughs> I met him at one of these. Uh, I was like, I showed up to one of these events for one of uh, one of the earlier events for event one of the, one of our event partners, and uh, he was there. And I was just kind of like, you know, minding my own, just making sure was, everything was smooth. And we started talking, and I was like, oh. And then I wasn't aware that he was just like, you know fresh out of the major leagues and then he told me yep. just fresh out he just got done doing a front office job with the res and i was like oh and i also just got an email from like my uh supervisor who was like i need three names for for a new potential employee and i was like and i met john and he's like checked every single box we hit it off uh, we really hit it off on like the communication side especially because he was doing quality control pretty much at the reds which is such an important job um to communicate black or communicate data from like the front office to the managers and players. Like that's probably mm -hmm. it's such an undervalued job in major league baseball and probably should be invested in more, uh, maybe everywhere, honestly. Um, so when he said he did that, I was like, perfect. Like, I didn't even, like, yeah, he, he's like, is it okay if I'm like a pitcher? I'm like, yeah, dude, like if you can communicate data to like people <laughs> who don't understand data, like you could work here for sure. So I, I think I went home and called my supervisor. I was like, I found the guy. So we're good. He's, he's definitely well-versed in the, in the metrics. It's, it's crazy. Like I, 
I've learned so much just from him on how to properly read metrics, what metrics I should be looking at with, with certain players. And that's how the conversation originally started on Twitter, which was we wanted to do a Twitter spaces, which didn't really go out as planned. So we figured let's just do a recording on this conversation. Obviously, we don't have John, we don't have Dave, we don't have Trent, but um, I think it's still going to be a unique conversation. And one of the original tweets that Dave sent out from our previous podcast, which was um, – knowing your players strengths and going towards those strengths and being able to identify that through metrics. And when you see a player and how do you develop a plan and use that data um, to teach certain strategies for that player? I think the biggest thing or the most important part of like getting started with that is like trying to find the why for that player. Like that player has to kind of like figure out like, a question that he wants answered and then be able to use data to kind of figure that stuff out. Um, that's like, that's kind of like been my experience is if you can get someone like, it's like a research project. Like you can get someone like really interested in like figuring out the answer. Um, and then you can show them that like certain data points can help them find that answer. That's where they get really like, um, engaged and then start understanding the data and whole, you know what I mean? Like, cause like sometimes yeah. if you just like shove the data down their throat or kind of passively tell them what it is, They'll go in, in one year and one out the and out the other. Like these are just, you know, kids have other important things they want to worry about. Um, but if you can get someone to be like, you know, figure out why my bat speed is this, and then my bat speed needs to be here for the next level. You never depending on the kid too, like it's a good it's you want to get a good feel for like the player who you're talking to. Um, but usually like you start with like a small metric. Uh these kids are pretty young, they have a lot of time to like dive into all their all their expected strengths. Um, but like start, probably start pretty basic, maybe like early connection, especially on the blast side, like, Hey, let's just find ways to get to our early connection consistent. Uh, and like being consistent, like, you know, consistently like in a good range for like two weeks at a time. Well, what I found interesting is that I sent out a tweet. I didn't, I sent out a poll and it was before our Twitter space. So I was going to use that as one of the main catalysts for the conversation. And there was 40 votes on it. And I asked the I asked the players, I can actually pull up the tweet right now. It'll be easier for the conversation. So as you can see right here, um, it says, do you like metrics and data during batting practice? And then 62% said yes, 20% said no, 10% said and different, and then 7.5% said Kenny Powers is my coach. coach. So <laughs> I do think that players want to see data. I think the gatekeepers, though, which are the coaches, um, do are a little shy when it comes to that and i'm i think that from a gatekeeper standpoint we need to be a little bit more open-minded and trust that the player is going to dive in because the coaches don't have the time to really digest the information at times but like your to your point that you just made which is players have a lot of time on their hands they have school and friends and then that's about it yeah yeah, and I would also say like adoption is a real. I think uh, Kyle Bodie had a really good thread about that, or maybe it was just like one tweet. But the adoption or the uh, like the systems in place and organizing that data so like it's scalable, because um, it's really hard to just like go one by one on each player and then try to remember. Like, there's got to be some sort of like system in place that kind of automates these things so you can scale the development of the the, the development plan of these players. Um, that's a pretty broad statement, but like there's a lot. Of, like Blast Connect is a great way to do that. Um, mm -hmm. all the data, all the data is in blast players can look at it. Coaches can look at it. We can get a snapshot and it takes like five minutes. Um, I think that's a, that's a big thing too, like systems and like automation in place when you're capturing, organizing, and then output de uh, the development plan. Do you, do you think that players get over bombarded with the data or do you think that it's just a misunderstanding of what they're looking at? Like they're, the numbers get like, it's, it gets confusing because it's a different language. Do you think you have to have somebody in your organization to really explain the data well? Yeah, I mean, you're, you would hope like if they're using the data, they're trying to use their best, they're trying to figure out the best way to communicate it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some sometimes like there's just a little bit of not buzzwords, but like blanket statements a little bit that some about or some develop, co coaches will use maybe that can just like you know like what was that tweet uh with john moscott the kid like, that is talking about get your launch angle right 
Yeah, it was basically <laughs> that, that, that's the, that was the main reason for the podcast with his episode because I got fired up when I saw it and um, it was basically you need to get your launch angle correct and it's like do you even know what a launch angle is and Kyle Bodie or not Kyle Bodie it was DeLunis that had a really good tweet I don't know if you know who DeLunis is but um, he was the former uh, bullpen uh, pitching coach for the Seattle Mariners and it was the same thing which is just throw strikes for a pitcher and he was like bro the best in the big leagues only are able to get the get a ball in the zone this doesn't matter if it's a strike or a hit ball 45 percent of the time and you expect little johnny to pound the zone with strikes for over 40 for 45 percent of the time that doesn't make any That's sense <laughs> yeah just shouting out results you can't really like osmosis the result you know <laughs> so, um I, I just think from a parent standpoint, you get frustrated because you like, you know, like, Hey, you can do it. You just do it. And you don't, you have no other way of expressing yourself. So it just comes out as throw strikes. Yeah, no, I, 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 that's yeah. It's kind of what I'm like. It's hard to like, it's just what it is. Like, it's just a bad blanket statement or like, I, I, I think it, we could call it buzzwords, but like, I don't know if they fully understand. I think you have to understand the word to make it a buzzword. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. Like, like yelling well, out. It's that it's that tweet that you it's that it's that tweet that you had on you said an, it was the definition of analytics. And <laughs> yeah. not many people know what the definition of analytics is, and then they're like, oh, it's just the analytics, d- data, metrics, do, do it. it. <laughs> yeah, well yeah, if you look up the definition of analytics, it's like using logic. So and that's where I wasn't like <laughs> I was subtweeting like MLB Network. I was like, I had MLB Network on in the background and I kept hearing like, they use analytics to do this. They use analytics to do that. Like, I think people are intelligent enough to like understand the difference between like, you know, biomechanics or pitch tunneling. Like, you know what I mean? Like they were saying like, oh, this one pitcher used analytics to improve a slider. It's like, no, he used like high speed cameras. He used biomechanics and he used like different grips uh, to figure that out. And then like they find a way to like tunnel with with, like the fastball. Like that's the stuff like I think fans are are, are eager to learn about. And if they don't like want to like, they they, they might not even know about it. You know what I mean? They just, all they understand is like there's analytics and then there's not analytics. But I think there's like, I, I don't know if it's like an American thing. I haven't traveled abroad, but like, it seems like we're really good at like, or we're, we're really like, we love the label of everything. Like there has to be a label, like old school and new school. But like, I don't know, like working with technology and numbers is exactly new school. Cause there's a lot of evidence that people were doing that in like the sixties for baseball. Like people were actually like in that uh, dollar sign, the muscle book, which is like, which I, I think me and you talked about a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's like one of the, like one of the best baseball books I've ever written, but it was written for about the, like the art of scouting kind of, which was in 1981, which is impressive. Yeah, it was a night. Yeah, written in 1981, published 1984, and then like republished again in like 93 with Baseball Perspectives because I stopped publishing it. Um, but like, there's like there's a whole chapter in there where there was this guy who was trying to actually measure bat speed, and he was actually trying to measure what we measure rotational acceleration, um, and on plane pretty much. Like he was like he used different terms, but they're the same thing. And it's funny because he, he found he actually tested it on like, you know, average players and he actually got a test on elite players like Pete Rose. And he found out, uh, you know, Pete Rose had this ability to wait on pitches for a really long time because he could accelerate into his bat speed quickly uh, than others, um, which is like what we measure like rotational acceleration on. So I, I got I want to like write about that actually at some point. Um, well, that's what's impressive about. So like steroids was not That's I'm going down a rabbit hole right now, but steroids wasn't that it wasn't that the person was a lot bigger and they could hit the ball super far. The thing that was a disadvantage was that Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire could literally sit and wait on a ball longer and gather more information of what's coming at them and make a decision way better than a person that was not taking steroids. A lot of people don't think about that. Like I, uh, someone, someone told me that it was about five years ago. He's like, think about the steroid era. It wasn't the home runs that was impressive. It was their ability to wait longer on certain pitches to make a decision. Yeah. And there's only two ways you can do that. Like that's another thing too. Like we get the question on like, how do you guys measure like, rotational acceleration because like, people say like it's because their body's well sequenced um like how can you measure the whole body with a bad sensor 
Well, that's because there's only two ways you can accelerate the bat like that fast. You either one, have like incredibly fast hands, like superhero, Floyd, May- Floyd Mayweather, Flash, Marvel Universe, fast hands. Mm-hmm. Or your body is just sequenced enough to where like you're creating this rubber band effect and it can just accelerate quickly. So probably nine times out of 10, it's going to be the well sequence part. So that's where like we were talking. Like, so like, I just want to kind of clear that up too, but like, it's kind of cool to see that because it's been valid. It was validated like in the eighties, um, but like, it still hasn't like hit like n- everywhere. You know what I mean? Like where no one's really talking about how fast a guy can accelerate into his bat speed, which is just this movement. Um, yeah. When we talk about rotational acceleration and everyone kind of still talks about the bat speed. The bat speed is like a prerequisite to the next level. Like that's just something you have to have. It's like strength. Um, it, but like after you get to like pro ball, like mainly when you get to like double A, that's where like everyone's bat speed, like they, they're in pro ball, they all have bat speed, but there has to be something else that's like a difference for them. And it is, it's like the acceleration into that bat speed. And then you're like, then then you're making layered decisions. And then especially with the pitch tunneling, you have to make late decisions. Fastballs of high spin. These sliders are getting outrageous. I'm actually really excited to see Chris Archer slider this year because he's back with the Rays. I think he's gonna be like player mm-hmm. of the year. I think he might. He could like Chris Archer has enough. I'm going down a rabbit hole, but Chris Archer has enough stuff to like be a Cy Young winner at some point. Well, even if you think about pitching now, it's getting so outrageously good. Degrom, they I saw a stat from it was the Three O Take podcast. I follow them on Instagram. And they had a breakdown of his fastball from 2014 all the way to now. And his fastball has gotten faster on average every single year. We're, it's going to get to a point where every single pitcher in the big leagues is going to be flirting with high 90s and touching triple digits. Yeah, There's so, so many yeah. dudes now that are throwing triple digits. Yeah, and these hammers are just so violent. <laughs> like these sliders are just unbelievable so back to our like what we were talking about like yeah you need to have like a, a significant advantage by the time you get to see elite pitching um that's like a good like we have some test cases i won't say who they are but we have some test cases of some players who are like first round picks um uh, first round second round picks out of high school um you know they hit like they hit like 25 bombs in the in high school ball they'll get the rookie ball and they'll hit pretty well because they're still playing against guys like your own age and then they get to like double A and like the strikeouts go up. Uh, there's the batting average goes down. There's less production and everyone's like, Oh, he was a flop. It's like, no, that guy was just, just bat speed dependent. Like you could cause you can be, you, you don't have to have like great rotational acceleration to play against like guys who are just throwing really good fastballs and bad sliders and bad curveballs. Like, but when you're facing elite pitching, that's where you have to make later decisions. Like you can see guys who will just go off throughout their whole career, get to double A, and then just like everything goes downhill. And like, oh, he flopped. Um, but that's where you can get like that's why blast is so cool. And I, I it, it's kind of it's becoming more of a norm, especially on the on the evaluation side, where you can get a little more predictive on the player with the blast metric, especially for rotational acceleration, bat speed um on who, how he's going to scale like how can a skill set scale so like from like a scouting terms like we say like bat speed like the player's floor and then rotational acceleration is like their ceiling like how much can this power and this skill set scale the next level i'll tell you right now that's what i that's what i focus on is is the rotational acceleration when i when i and i'm teaching that's the thing that i'm going after because I, I know that's a controllable. I feel like bat speed is like the tall hands and everything like that. And if I get the rotational acceleration up, the bat speed's going to increase naturally. Yeah. I mean, the bat speed will, yeah, as I get older, as long as they're not just like crushing cheeseburgers and not sleeping and, you know, and not taking, like the bat speed's going to go up. Um, you're going to hit the weight room. Everyone's doing like yoga now and they're flexible. The core is getting stronger. Like people are focusing on the right muscles now. So bat speed. Yeah. Is gonna get, is gonna get stronger as you go up. Um, I'm actually curious, how do you develop rotational acceleration? Because that is more of a journey for a player than anything, I think, just because there's so much to do with um, their deficiencies. You kind of have to figure out. Like for me, like I I can't rotate at all. I rotate like a freaking grade school kid because like my pelvic <laughs> I can't, my my pel- like my pelvic area just can't rotate. My back is just like shot. So, it's like, a lot know, of. Like, um... 
it's a lot of flexibility, like you said. It's a lot of mobility, especially in the spine area. Because I noticed when I was playing in the game that the spine was by far the hardest thing to fix. And then also, which is, this is going to sound crazy, is um, your mobility in your feet. So being able to mas- massage out your feet. And then also knowing what, what muscle groups are able to power that rotational acceleration. So I primarily focus in on the core. And then I also focus in on the back hip. So we, we, I, spend a, I spend a ton of time on actually getting a proper load so you're able to develop that energy and so you have some type of energy system behind you so that you're able to transfer that energy into the baseball. So many guys that I get are going to be very handsy because that's the first thing we teach in hitting yeah. because, because, we, we, because you want the kid to be successful because if a kid does, is, can't hit, He's going to say this game sucks. I'm not playing this anymore. So the first thing that we work on as hitting instructors is, well, we got to make contact. If you make contact, we have, we have a chance that you're going to like this game and you're going to still play. If not, you're probably going to pick up like soccer or basketball or football um, because it's just a little bit easier and it's raw athletic ability. Yeah. That's like music to my ears. Everything you just said, (laughs) (laughs) but I, 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 I like that point that you made on yoga because so many kids don't do yoga. They think it's like this voodoo type of stuff and they don't think that it like works and it's for girls. It's for chicks and it, it, softball girls. Sorry, but guys definitely think this way is that yoga is too relaxed for me. It's not as it's too uh, there's, there's not enough action involved and that, and that if, to be able to support your spine and be able to support your core yoga by far is one of the best things for you. Yeah. I just, I would just tell them like, you can either be tough and average or you can throw the ego out the window and get better. <laughs> yeah. you know I mean? Well, it's not, it's not fair too. Cause you're from LA and I'm from the Midwest. So like LA it's, it's already acceptable. <laughs> yeah, There's like people doing yoga outside my window right now. <laughs> That's a good point. Softball players rotational acceleration is actually like incredible because i do like i do know like women have like a better ability to be like flexible and move their body like, they move their body differently than men um mm-hmm. i have seen some crazy rotational acceleration numbers on the softball side because i dive around like all the other college portals we have um mm-hmm. like university of oklahoma um all these other colleges like their rotational their, their rotational acceleration numbers are crazy i think you saw like you see oklahoma softball hit like 19 home runs in like their first game of the well, year if you, if you look, look at, at their if you look at how they train though they train for that baseball player baseball programs right now don't train for that there's a certain amount of them that do but majority of them don't train how a softball program trains which like lsu lsu the the drills that they're they're throwing out there is brilliant. I like what they're doing. There's certain drills I'm like, eh, I don't know about that one. But at least they're experimenting and testing. I feel like for baseball on the college end of things, there's certain programs that are testing and trying to figure out how to how to mix and match and actually break something and refix it. But there's some others that are just work. This is how it is. This is how it always will be. We will never change. What's yoga? What's rotational acceleration? Like they're not willing to change. Well, you know, I kind of have a theory on that too, just because like baseball has always had this like top down, um, like top down influence because of like Major League Baseball. So like Major League Baseball has always had like scouts in every state, in every region with scout ball teams and influencing travel ball coaches or college coaches. Or so there's always there's like this top down influence that's always been there for baseball, which might be the reason why it's like always it's always been a little harder to like change things. Where softball, they don't really have like a top-down influence. Like, our our college data sets are better than the pro data sets because that's you know a lot of college softball players end up going out and working somewhere else um, instead of playing professional softball. And these these the professional softball teams um, don't have like a scouting department and an analytics department that like kind of go isn't like, they don't have like a representative like every single state. So I've always thought, and I because I remember uh, my former employer we were thinking about getting the softball and that was a difference with like the area code games for, uh, for baseball where, you know, like we had area scouts choosing the players, running the workouts, um, scouting the talent and everything. And then softball didn't really have that. They just had like the, the biggest influence was like the college coaches, but they don't have like, you know, a 60 person scouting staff in each state, uh, kind of guiding these softball programs to do certain things. So I think like, 
all the softball organizations kind of are probably think they're top dog. So there's no mm-hmm. like real, like whatever they think is valuable is what's valuable. Um, there's no like resource to go to. Um, maybe I'm being a little ignorant on that, but like, that's kind of like the difference I've seen because that influence of major league baseball, we see it on Twitter every day. Like I didn't do that back in my day. I didn't do this back in my day is a little different for software. Yeah, the whole hunky dory, like I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, like, well, I never did this. Like, I smoked. Eight, I do eight think, darts I do think and... there's a, there's a great point in that you made, which is, I, I, I think there's a, the turnover is as bigger in softball than it is in baseball because baseball there is serious careers not saying baseball or softball isn't serious but i'm saying like there's a lot there's big money in major league baseball it's it's america's pastime softball is not there yet i mean hopefully at some point we can have a, a legit professional softball league that is really knocking on the door and you're getting serious fans um in the stadium but the turnover if you think about it if I'm a college softball girl, there's only one route for me technically to really move on, which is I'm either going to play professionally or I'm going to be a college coach. There's no real serious scouting department. The opportunities there. I mean, I, the college women, the women's college or the women's college world series is one of the top things like watched on ESPN. It's like, it's one of ESPN's best products is the college world, mm-hmm. the women's college world series. And the game's fun to watch. It's, you know, it's, it, it takes like an hour and 20 minutes for the game to wrap up and it's very quick. Um, it's a great, it's probably it, a benefit. It's a, it's, it's a, it's an advantage. I feel like it's an advantage for softball to be that because you're, you're getting new blood into the sport and they're going to be able to real, they're, they're going to adopt technology a lot faster, which is what you, what, what I feel like watching the college programs they're willing to test and experiment and do different things to figure out how to make their girls a little bit better. I feel like baseball is like, well, if it's not broke, why fix it? It's also hard to tell because like, I think we have like louder voices in baseball that kind of like bash everything too. So it's hard to tell like how many, how many people are actually like, it's like the Bitcoin space. You got, you got really (laughs) loud mouth people like uh, Bitcoin maximalists. And then I'm in, I'm in there just trying to figure out how to, how the space actually works. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, like I still wonder, is it a currency? Is it like kind of like yeah. property? Is it a saving? Like, I, don't, I don't know, but um, <laughs> but you do have a lot of loud voices and people that double down on it. So, yeah. And that's the same thing with baseball. You got, you got some really loud mouth guys. Like um, there's, there's a couple accounts out there. I won't mention it that um, will spout off and call you out for no particular reason if they don't agree with something and they could be completely wrong, but they'll, they'll battle it to the very end. Well, sometimes, like, I, I'm thinking we're probably talking about the same people. Sometimes they, like, they aren't, like, they're probably trying to say, like, what they're trying to say isn't exactly, like, incorrect sometimes. Like, um, like sometimes they'll be like, you know, analytics isn't the answer. It's like, yeah, 100% agree. Like, it's not the complete answer. It's more it's of like, a way to get like, the answer, though. Of, yeah, it's, it's a way to get to the answer. Um, but, like... So like I feel like there's just like this, and you get that with like insecurity a little bit, um, yeah. And you want to feel, because I do feel like there was, and me and John actually talked about this the first day we met. But like, you don't like just because ugh, it's it's hard to like phrase this, but you don't want to completely just forget everything that these guys done in the past, like the coaches, the scouts, the old major leaguers. But just because, like, we believe in this new process or a new, or we're, we're adapting a new process, doesn't mean we should be like, "Hey, everything you did was wrong." And I do think sometimes people, because people are just so polarized on Twitter, you only get 140 words to like say something, and it can come. And when, you, when you're trying to fit everything in there, it can come off as very matter of fact. Like analytics is a new thing, and then so people can just read that wrong. And I think a lot of people are still like not trained to un, like. Like uh, to take something in 140 characters as like the whole thought, like they think it's a whole person's thought. It's really a part of it. And yeah. that's where it gets like escalated. And you have like the, the old, ugh, I hate using that term, but like the old school guy just coming after this guy and this guy looks weak. So he's coming after him and then they all have people joining in, but really everyone's on the same page. Mm-hmm. They're trying to figure out how to like improve in baseball. So it's tribes, man. It's tribes. When you get a tribe going, it ends up, it ends up escalating real fast. Yeah, yeah, real fast. 
Like I do um, think there should there should still be like a level of respect for the older guys. Like that's how it should start off those conversations. Just be like, hey man, I respect everything you've done. Um yeah. and you are clearly like you have more experience than I have, but like this is something I'm interested in. This is something I'm ex I want to explore and see that's like something that could help. Um, and then maybe you can like include those guys into like your research project. Like that's when you're like, Hey, tell me about the curveballs back then. Tell me what you saw. Like, tell me how you trained. I think it's a, it's traditional versus new age and it's, uh, the play you're not, you can't fight technology. It, it just engulfs everything. Like fighting the internet is the, you're not going to win. You're just not going to, when you have a whole bunch of people trying to figure out how to get better, you're, you're going to lose just plain and simple. I mean, think about, um, the music industry with, uh, Napster and the music industry try to figure out their whole model was completely flipped upside down in a matter of a year, two years. And then now they're still trying to figure it out, which now nah, it's going to get interesting when we start thinking about bl blockchain technology. But anyways, that's a totally rabbit hole. People are not listening to this about, um, NFTs or cryptocurrencies, but I want to go down this tweet that, um, you shared, the it was it was about a month ago and i found it super interesting and it and it's a premise that i had um i i never i never really dove deeper into it and i i can't stand exit velocity off of a t i just i don't understand why people really think that that's a solid metric to base if that guy can play college or professional um but jacob had a really good tweet and it said data from the area code games comparing players average bat speed in a home run derby versus end game the difference was um as much as 10 miles per hour and here's here's the chart that um he offered up what's your thoughts on scouting and evaluations and you work with third parties on this what are they seeing on exit velocity and bat speed off of BP and game, like how are they viewing it? How are scouts viewing it? How's PBR and these other showcase companies viewing it? Well, I mean, it depends on the showcase company, but um, I'll speak to like PB. They're really good. PBR is really good at taking things into context and variables, which is like what, how you should take this stuff in. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, like a lot of players will do it themselves and parents will do it with their kids. They'll tie their they'll tie themselves to like a metric. Like I have seventy eight miles per hour bat speed. Well, like that depends on how you're hitting the baseball. Like the you know the environment matters. So we have like and this is kind of what we kind of like we kind of expected this kind of outcome too. We just wanted some sort of like solid data set to kind of show this and present it. And I think we're gonna probably build on it more, but. So when we started doing all these PBR uh, showcases and we did like over close to 30,000 30, players with these kids, like I have a 30,000 player like data set from this past year of PBR and they do like the bat speed and, and like showcase BP is all is usually higher than what the like that level of play average is from our data sets. And that's usually because like, what are you trying to do in showcases? You're trying to show off what you can do. And that's usually power. And then two, you know that you know what's coming and most kids are hitting the ball out in front and so the kids who actually have like pretty good like bodies and are well sequenced have good bat speed and they're hitting the ball out in front yeah they'll they'll get over 80 miles per hour bat speed like, pretty consistently but in a game that's the thing is like you want again like, and, and you look at a game sample size it's different because you're making contact at different points like if it's an outside pitch you're going to hit that ball a little deeper so like the bat speed it speeds up the more uh, the, or the more it has to travel that bat has to travel. So if I'm hitting the ball out in front, the bat speed is going to be higher than when I hit the ball that about out here. It's the same bat speed, but the reading is different. You know what I mean? Like that's the thing is like mm -hmm. you just want to make sure you have bat speed, um, and that's a big thing too. Is like we look at like I look at a kid in the past, and like I, I had a parent like email one of the scouting directors at PBR and was forwarded over to me. He's like, Hey, my kid usually is around uh, 75 miles per hour bat speed. Um, but his bat speed was like 68 at the, uh, at the uh, showcase. Like what's up with this? So I went to the kid's like profile and I found some videos of him hit hitting off a tee. Sure enough, the tee was pretty out, out far in front. He's probably manipulating his swing a little bit too, to get power. And then I looked at his video, his uh, BP video from the belly button open side at PBR. 
and everything was deep in the zone. He was making a lot of contact opposite way. I don't know if the, if the BP thrower is just throwing the ball outside um, or if it was cut or if it was cold, the kid wasn't warmed up. So these are all variables you want to like take into account. Um, and he was hitting the ball like pretty deep in the zone. So like his bat didn't have a lot of time to travel. And even if you don't have a video, you can look at that time to contact too. If like the bat speed, if you look at like, uh, if you look at a kid's bat speed that was like around 75, and then you look at a kid's uh, swing that was around uh, 68, look at the time to contact, the time to contact is quicker than the other one. He's probably, he probably hit that ball a little deeper. So yeah, and then to answer your question about the tee, like, it depends what you're looking for. Like to me, hit bat speed off a tee is kind of like the bench press. It just shows how strong the kid is. Um, it 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 doesn't tell a whole lot, but like one individual swing doesn't tell a whole lot either. It's kind of in context of like the sample size, the environment, and you're kind you're really just getting like a baseline. You're not gonna find out everything about that kid at a showcase, but it's like really important to figure out like what's a snapshot of this kid. And is he willing for, is he, is he important enough for me to go follow watching games? And then, and then like, you know, it's, you want to get really creative on trying to figure out who this kid is. Cause like, there's also some kids who have great metrics and showcases, like the bat speeds around, you know, 78 miles per hour and their rotational acceleration is around 22 and on plane is great. And then you go to a high school, a bunch of high school games and the results aren't matching up. Like his exit velocity isn't great. Um, his stats aren't great. He's not very productive. And you're like, how is that? So like that kid in the showcase was great. I know his blast metrics are great. Why aren't the results showing up? And that's when you're like, that's when you should like do research around the kid. Like, what is that? What's the coach telling that kid to do? Is he telling him to like take the first pitch and then work the other way? Like what kind of program is he in? So, and I've seen, we've seen that to where like kids are not doing well in their high school seasons. They do well in showcases. Um, and they're like, oh, that guy's a five o'clock hitter, not a seven o'clock hitter. It might just be like the, it might just be like the program he's in. Like maybe he's just like, he's the coaches are really telling him to stay short. He doesn't like the big swing. He's not letting his body do what it can do. Um, and you know, we do see a lot of high school coaches who kind of like try and control things. You know, they have like 10, 10 bunt defenses and um, you know, have is to there take a case? first pitch. Is there a case to recruit the player that doesn't have the? great metrics yes yeah absolutely um and again and, you know recruiting is probably more of a bigger term depending on like financial aid and scholarship and all that and you can bring that kid in but like i yes like if you're a small school junior college or even a big school just wants to take a shot in this kid like maybe he's a he has great grades and can be a great walk-on like that's a kid i'd take a shot on because that's what i mean that's what's so great about the like blast metrics and I think we're getting close to having a confidence level on this too, because people are so result driven. Like they just want to see results. They want to be able to like quantify this kid, why he's so good. But that's the thing with blast is like, you really do get a predictive, become more of a predictive data set on how good this kid could be at the next level. If we just allow him to do certain things again, like, so you think, might... you think the showcase numbers, like if they're, if they're hitting off of a T that's a, a decent indicator that the player is going to be, pretty good i uh, i always consult with our event partners not to hit data not to capture data off the team especially if they're serious i mean some of these guys some of these some of these event partners are more de development focused so maybe they just want to like work on things off a of tee you should still monitor yourself off a of tee um but if you're trying to get a strong a strong data set the strongest data sets you can have are as close to in game as possible and that's live RBP. Live RBP is the, probably the best because it's the most controllable thing you can have. If you can get a really good BP thrower, like a guy with like high spin, um, like there's one guy out here who's just like, he throws all the BP for the Brewers area code team, which they cover Southern Cal. Uh, Tom Myers, he's an area scout for the Cubs. His BP is tough to hit. I mean, it has on the hand, on the Nasty right spin. hand, right hand. Yeah, like arm side tail, really tough. Um, he can kind of like click it a little bit and it'll be on the out on the left side, on the glove side. He's a right hander. Um, and like that data set is really, it, it's consistent. And then another, the other, the other best data set you can get is probably off the machine. If you get, if you get a bunch of swings off the machine, um, that's a good one as well. I know machines are tough though, because they're hard to time up. But again, if you want to figure out the kid's swing, uh, uh, scale to the next level and he's making solid contact off the machine over and over again um you have all these fancy machines off like high spin sliders all that that's because it's so you're not you can't really like 
time up machine unless that thing is like already gone. Yeah. So then that, that shows that kick can accelerate quickly. Like I could not hit off machine to save my life. I think I had to like buy so many broken bat or so many new wood bats um because i was thinking off a t because i couldn't rotate but like my bat speed was like okay <laughs> um like live on bp it looked great i'll find a place to play like if i'm on a machine like i'm gonna skip that showcase but like yeah um but yeah as close a game like as i learned a lot of this from um like the brewers organization when i was at the area code games because they were they dove into blast like super early uh especially on the evaluation side um like everyone's doing it now but i got to learn a lot from because they're so southern cow based um, I saw them every year at Area Code Games, and uh, I mean, it's funny, like, there was one scout who, when the when Blast first started capturing at the Area Code Games, they were, like, very, like, con- like, you know, like, what is going on? I don't want my players having, like, rubbers on the end of the knob of the bat. And then, like, a year later, I had lunch with that scout, and he, like, pulled his wallet out because he was paying that thing, and, like, a Blast sensor, like, fell out of his pocket. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of funny, but they. Uh, I mean, I know he, and that's kind of what I kind of learned. I was like, hey, what data set is super valuable? Um, and they, I mean, they, he always told me like live arm BP, um, machine, and then in game data is super valuable as well, but it has to be a large sample size, and it's that's where it gets really hard to capture in game BP and like showcase settings because a kid could have like, or even in the tournaments, like a kid could have 10 ABs and make contact three times. And like the results are like, yeah, I could have hit 300, but you only have three swings to really evaluate. Um, again, like you can get a pretty decent base, like, but unless you, unless you have like a sample size for like showcase and then you want to get a couple, couple mm-hmm. deep, uh, in-game swings, like, yes, you can work with that. You just have to be conscious that like, hey, he only had three swings, but the sample size and the environment when it comes to evaluation, evaluating is so important. And I don't mean like just like with like scouts and evaluators, I mean, like, for players as well. Like, players should be evaluating themselves constantly. Um, that's, like, we, so we did important. a podcast. We did a podcast episode about almost a year ago about the tactical guide to get recruited. And I still think, I'm still bullish on it, is that if a player has a blast motion sensor, he should be making sure that things charged constantly and capturing as much data as he can. And then if he runs into a home run, tweet that tweet it out right away because that data right there is going to tell a lot for a scout like yeah i saw you hit a home run that's great but like i mean what's what was your bat speed what was your rotational acceleration what's your hand speed what what was the time to contact what what are the what are those numbers and also how fast was the kid throwing is he throwing 75 and you hit a home run great we see 83 84 every single day at junior college baseball like we need we need to know if that's an actual pitcher or if that's just a mop up guy and it's a stat day. Well, it's also like if you can do a lot of the work, like you want to work with people that doesn't force them to do more work. So like if a play, if I'm an evaluator and I have a couple of players who are just feeding me all the information I can, it helps me get to a decision quicker on those guys if they're giving me all the information. So like yeah. when my boss is like, you need to make some decision on players. Like I'm probably gonna pick the guys that I have enough information on to like give like to give an expectation to my boss like this is what these players can do um i've seen enough times to kind of see that i have enough information on them so that's the other thing 100 percent. like sometimes players are very like scared i think to like uh hand out information or data or like where you ever which i'm so confused i'm so confused about that like i don't understand it because the story can always be written it's not like that's set in stone. We're not living in a world where it's snail mail and I send out something and then that's the end of it. Like the person's going to forget about it. They're going to forget about it. I mean, I, I can't even, we were talking about it today. What day is it? I don't know. It's COVID world. I have no idea. <laughs> well, it, and other thing too, is like, if you can show someone that you've gotten better, like historical data set, if you can deliver a historical data set to a recruiter or any or a scout, like that's great. Like showing this kid, like the way, it's a trend. It's like, it's what we were talking about earlier before we started this with like stocks. Like I want to yeah. see what the trend has been like, if the trend keeps doing this, like he's going to keep going up there's, or just potential to do that. So yeah, I mean, I, I kind of understand why player, I understand, I understand what it is that players get nervous about releasing information too soon, but they shouldn't, they should just get, they should just release as much information as they can to these evaluators. It doesn't have to be like direct to the person. It can be on a social page. It could be on their own website. It could be on the PBR profile p- profiles. It could be on those sick PDFs that you guys put together, by the way. Those are awesome with the hot links. Appreciate and everything. it. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, that's so sick. I mean, that's what I would do if I was a player. I just create my own. Actually, that's what I did. I I, I wasn't a great like baseball player. I was pretty average on every level I went. Um, I played like a five A high school in Texas, and so I got like I just kind of used that, and then made a bunch of highlight videos, and then just kind of condensed everything like GPA, test scores, like stats, summer ball, and just like send it out. Like the guys had enough information, just like kind of understand who I was. So yeah. that's what it's, del- it's, it's developing kind of- your own story. You have yeah, to no. your own, you, have to, you have to develop your own story. You have to be willing to take the reins and market market the crap out of yourself. Because if you just sit there and like, oh, I'm just gonna go play some games and hope it happens, uh, you're you're lost, bro. You're not you're not getting picked up. And if you do, it's a hot damn miracle. <laughs> yeah, I've always had. I've always like, I always hated that expression. It's like if you're good enough, they'll find you. Um, yeah. yeah. Cause it's not really true. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> you kind of have to like the inner secrets of baseball. It's not true, guys. Yeah, I mean, unless you're like your parent is and works in a major league organization, or you live in like you know, if you if you yeah, if you play in uh, the Trinity League out here in Southern California with like Harvard Westlake, all them, yeah, they'll find you because like they're camping out at those games, but like not everyone is doing that. Like so. Yeah, I mean, you gotta, you gotta get, and you have to. Like, I think it's really important to get uh, validated information on yourself. And I, what I mean by that mm-hmm. is, like, you have to, you have to get a third party to start collecting it on you, whether it's your travel organization or it's a PBR organ or PBR, um, because, like, again, a good evaluator sometimes these guys don't do this, but like, they'll get data sets from players and like, they'll be like, how do I know this is you and not your older brother who I know is playing a triple A right now? So like, there's yeah. no video. There's nothing to like really like validate this. Who captured it? How was it captured? Like, you got to answer those questions for these evaluators. Um, I'm, yeah, I've seen some of that. I've seen some guys like not even ask those questions. They just like take the data set. That's it. I think some people are turned off on showcases at times because of the whole quote unquote, I hate this term money grab. Um, because like, yeah, are there things out there that's going to be a money grab? Yes. There's going to be snake oil salesmen out there, but we're, we're in a more defined space than we were 10 years ago where it seemed like everyone's mother was doing a showcase. If that person, if that showcase doesn't have a brand name behind it and no one knows who they are, don't go to it. But PBR and perfect game and the, these third party vendors, like they are doing things right and it's validating it's on the internet you're creating your internet footprint i know they cost a lot but at the same time you're asking for their opinion and they're going to give you a straight up answer they're not going to give you this fluffy um this fluffy story um that you don't need well what i would focus if i was a parent what i'd focus on when they're looking at these like showcases is understanding like get the questions answered on like how is like information being distributed Cause you're going to see a lot, you'll see a lot of showcase companies, um, just talk about that. They're, they'll say like, we're going to capture this. We'll have video. We'll have college coaches there who are probably paid. And then, but they never mention like, how is it being distributed? Um, like PBR talks about how it's being distributed. It's on the player profiles. They just go off on Twitter during events. I mean, you, you have like the state accounts and national accounts and the scouting directors accounts all just like mm-hmm. vomiting information. Um, that that would be like the biggest question I would have as a parent is like, okay, you're collecting all this information. How is it getting out to people? And if you don't have that answer, yeah, if you don't get the, if the distribution isn't uh, being answered, that question isn't being answered or you're not comfortable with it, then don't pay for it. Like, I don't have anything against about some showcases that are expensive, but just make sure you're getting a good service for it. I wouldn't recommend going to twelve five hundred dollars showcases every year. Just get mm-hmm. just pick a cup, pick a couple where the distribution is going to be really solid. You can get a good baseline. You're going to get everything condensed into a good package, and then you know it's going to get, uh, it's going to get, it's going to be received by some good colleges, some good evaluators. Um, and also you can just take like go to PBR showcase and I can come back to you, Spike, and be like, hey, this is what happened. This is what I got. Um, can you help me like distribute this or can you help me get better in certain things so I can go back two months later, get these captured, or you can help me capture it and get it out there. So well, you know I mean? a lot of the guys that are getting looked at in our organization right now, the, the reason that they're getting looked at is because one, we were very bullish on Twitter. We're very aggressive 
And we, the reason we're very aggressive is because we noticed what PBR was doing and we wanted to do the same thing. And then we did our own PBR scout days in different locations. And now a whole bunch of dudes are getting looked at because of that day. And they created their story before the event. So some of them already were recognized and then they started getting some notice. Then PBR came in, validated that data. And now these dudes are getting serious looks and they're having serious conversations. It's not this, Hey, come to our camp or Hey, um, I like what you did, but, and it's just a blanket email. It's literally hard conversations, which is very fascinating. And it's a good use case for someone that's wondering how does someone actually get picked up if no one knows who they are? Yeah, no, 100%. It's also going to be interesting. And this is, this is me just like kind of being outside the box a lot. Twitter kind of, kind of, um, we already experienced it with spaces, but like, uh, Twitter kind of diving into like certain, uh, subscription based models, uh, or trying to find different verticals that go into a subscription based and have to be set up. So ad driven, which is like another story, but it's gonna be curious to see what kind of like how that's going to like, if anyone in the baseball space is going to kind of uh, adapt to that a little bit. Maybe they're going to be using uh, Twitter accounts as a service, a subscription-based service to get players on a platform for evaluators. So everything's condensed because, you know, like everyone just wants to limit friction. Like no one wants to talk to each other. They just want to get the information and see the information and then move on. So any like that's I'm kind of curious, maybe we'll see what that looks like. But that's what PBR is doing is like after an event, I don't have to talk to anybody. I can just go to the event page on PBR.com see all the data and then click on the player's profile to see the historical data sets and like, oh, and then like a real written report of what they saw at the event. So anytime you're like limiting friction or the need for people to talk to each other to get information. And then if you're, and then when you do have to talk to somebody, it's for an important conversation, like some intangible stuff. That's like, those are models at scale. So I wonder if like baseball industry is going to eventually like or not or it's going to kind of adapt to these subscription-based social media models a little bit there's an interesting um app out there i don't know if you've seen it press sports um they're based out of atlanta yeah they they have an interesting model i don't know if it's going to work or not uh, but it's literally just recruiting and it, it's becoming more my thought is if they go more towards the social route actual social instead of just recruiting videos i think it'll take off but it kind of goes to that point. Is it going to be a place where it's everything's consolidated and then like coaches can then go to the, go to that kid's press sports page and literally see everything he has. I mean, Twitter's like that, but there, it's just Twitter's so noisy that sometimes it's kind of hard to be seen. So maybe these coaches are in on, on press sports and then now the kids can actually be seen on press sports. I don't know. It's, it's interesting. We're still early. <laughs> Well, that's what's interesting too. If they, if Twitter does go to these like subscription-based models, it will be a little less noisy because it'll be more tailored to like what you want to see based off like maybe what you're paying for, so the algorithm doesn't get all messy. But like, imagine it, what's up? What was the uh, what was the Twitter account that was like showing all these? They're still doing it. They show the pictures and pictures are being signed off it. Pitching Ninja has flat ground app. Flat, ground, flat ground. That's what I want. Yeah. yeah imagine. I think I think, I think I think Pitching Ninja controls that. Yes, he does. He does. Um, what a what a story that guy is too. By the way, holy crap! Um, <laughs> he's just like grown. Like that's incredible. I would love. Yeah. And he's a lawyer too, guy. which is crazy. Like, yeah. how do you have time yeah. to do the social media yeah. game and break down video, edit the video, put it out there, and then still be able to be a lawyer? He's a good thinker. I've watched him in some of his new podcasts too. Like, he just thinks. He's a good thinker. He just has good questions and he knows how to get things out. But imagine uh, if that account was started behind a paywall, like a cheap paywall, like $2 a month. And then this guy's doing his like passion project for $2 a month for like, I don't know, like how, how many followers do you have now? Like 50,000 or something. So you have 50,000 people paying $2 a month. And then you have this guy collecting extra income to do some research and development to even improve this, to find new ways to get kids out there, new platforms. So that's, I do like companies with subscription-based models because they usually have enough, they, they're usually using that money for research and development. Well, thinking about our, everything too. Well, thinking about Blast and us, like we're, we're going to, we're going to reinvest into it. If we didn't reinvest, we wouldn't be good companies. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have the uh, business businesses that we have and helping players and, 
um, families and and when people are able to say yeah their their vote is basically their money like I think that this is a really good idea we're gonna keep we're gonna keep enjoying that service um, it's gonna be very interesting when you start seeing small micro payments on the internet when we're able to do that um, with again it goes back to the cryptocurrency debate like it could end up being that where I can pay a penny or a half a penny. Um, to end up seeing that and the transaction is it makes sense because it's a it's a micro transaction and then now you start getting people to have money and then they reinvest it and the space grows even more yep no 100 percent. it's uh it's gonna be i don't know it's gonna be really interesting to see how because if you really think about it and it might be a little off topic here but i'm at, another thing i'm kind of curious to see because we already see major league baseball shrinking minor league baseball um major league baseball has a lot of like the teams have a lot of hand has a has a pretty big handle on the development of these players which is kind of unusual if you look at like the rest of professional sports like hockey uh like professional hockey players like don't really the teams don't touch them development wise really the only kind of development is more of like a team philosophy but like one of the like one of the biggest, the biggest, one of the biggest trends in the last like couple of years is these hockey skill coaches that have more say on these players' developments, so, like Patrick Kane, um, Cindy Crosby, Malkin. All these guys have their own skill coaches who are also devouring video during the season and like coaching them throughout the year, and then they're in contact with the team to make sure what they're working on is you know fits the team philosophy as well. Like I know. Um, What's his name? I think it's David. David Belfry is a really big time hockey skills coach right now, and he has a great. He has a book out. He just kind of, or I don't know if he wrote it, but it's a good book. Um, he kind of talks about how he like he's very and he's very exclusive. He doesn't like take in a, as much players as he can. He takes in players who mm-hmm. are kind of like you know good for him to like coach or can afford it as well but like he won't work with a player unless he watches like at least 48 games on that player and then he they go through like all this insane, like they go on this in the off season like the teams don't talk to these players they're with their skills coaches all year um it's pretty interesting so set up similar to like basketball so basketball is set up very similar shooting coaches dribbling yeah all yep. these skills coach like that's what i'm i'm kind of curious if that's going to start hitting baseball because i think it could like baseball because- it's the communication side, right? Because yeah, I have, I have guys that are, at, they're in college and they want my opinion on their swing. And I'm thinking to myself, but don't you have a college coach? And I'm thinking to myself that, that it makes sense because they trust the validation of me. So they want a serious opinion. At what point does that happen to where now, baseball major league baseball players are going to go towards their original coach or a coach that they find on the internet that they completely believe in like diesel fitness down in tampa is just putting out dudes left and right um pitchers because of their training programs like they're very serious about putting out pitchers and same thing with driveline like at what point does um minor league baseball gets so condensed that now we have a very strong base of players that we know like oh yeah that guy's probably gonna make major Major league League baseball baseball in like five years yeah you know and it just i don't i you see with quarterbacks too that's a big quarterback coach has been a big thing Mm -hmm. in the nfl the past couple years i I got to see a lot of these guys perform at student sports where i used to work we operated the elite 11 the quarterback competition so I got to see like Palmer and all these guys like work for these players and they were already like slowly building like a, a clientele and they still work with these guys. But like, that's what I mean. I think the individualization on the off season, on the development for these players is more advantageous because it's more like scale. It's more scalable. Um, it's, mm-hmm. it's really tough for organization to individually cut up development plans for each, each individual player. Like maybe the organization just be, should be focusing on, um, this is what we want out of our players. This is how we're going to win this year. Like now we're going to focus on this and that, uh, but the player's skill sets should be maybe developed outside. And then the communication between the organization and these skills coaches um, can make sure everything, everything's on the same page. Like for, I mean, for example, 
Yeah, like, well, for, well, for example, like uh, CAA, the eight big uh, big agency, creative artist agency, you can see mm-hmm. like the difference between like their hockey side and their baseball side. You know, the baseball side, you know, contract negotiation, branding, all that, because that's what you do with the baseball players. I mean, yes, they do they do do a lot of development as well, or they set up development plans for them. But um, on the hockey side, they have full on like camps for like prospective clients or guys who are using them as, as advisors um like full on like it's a full on it's like a development program like the hockey side of ca is com- almost like different from the baseball side because like mm-hmm. the hockey culture is like you take care of your development on your own outside and you're working with someone who's like going to make sure you have what you need i don't know i just think that's gonna eventually i think that's gonna eventually hit baseball and you're seeing like all these guys go to driveline and um, I really like what Dragline did like early on, like where they're really working with like minor leaguers or guys who like made it for like free agents come to mm-hmm. Dragline and then they improve and then they sign up a team. So there was like validation that it was like working. Um, but I don't know, there's like so many, there's so many intelligent people out there who are so good at what they do. And like if I was a player, I'd probably maybe focus on working with that person a little more. I think from a major know. league standpoint on expenses wise, like I'm, there's these there's these small little companies these clubs are starting to develop why would i want to get in that space and and maybe get a little bit of profit but not to the extent that what i'm going to what i'm getting from my tv deals so why why not condense the minor leagues why don't we just trust the college system trust the club system and just let's let's roll let's see what happens it, it makes more sense because you're you're condensing your bottom line no, totally. I would love to see like a, a similar draft type as hockey as well, where you can get drafted by a team out of high school and they own your rights. But if I want to go play at Vanderbilt for two or three years, um, and then when I'm ready to sign, I'll sign. Like I kind of I, I hate the I hate the draft and the deadline to sign, and I think I make a decision in like a couple. At weeks. least they have that draft and follow, and then they got rid of it. They got rid of it Whatever exactly. I, I would like to see it come back. Um, because then like. College because of like the whole ten round, we saw a lot of players that should have been drafted pretty high and got paid end up in college ball because you know the, 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 the signing bonuses were tripped throughout the year. No one was looking for it. Mm-hmm. Like, they would have made their entire signing bonus by the time they're eligible again in college. So, like I thought, Kevin Parada was the best player in the draft, the best hitter in the draft last year, just because like we saw him. So we, I got the, I got a chance to see him a lot area code games and. Uh, PBR California captured a bunch of data on him as well, uh, blast data. So like his blast data is like phenomenal. It looks so good, and his results equal it. So I was like, this guy. What do you know? Do you remember what his blast data was? So yeah, his bat speed remember? was like yeah, it, his bat speed ranged because he was hitting the ball all over in different contact points, which is nice to see. Um, it was like seventy five. He got to eighty a couple of times on some pitches inside, and then but his rotational acceleration was like nothing below twenty two. He even got up to like thirties a couple of times. That's yeah, it's crazy. Just, 30, yeah, he was pumping 30 Gs. Yeah, he pumped 30 Gs the last day I said I got on him. I think was, he pumped like a 32. And then um, his on plane was like, I think it was anywhere, or his on plane was always above 70%, which is where you want to be. But his early connection too uh, was like so close to 90 degrees every swing, which is so hard to do. Um, you can see it too. Like what he's, and he's he, I think he's now like uh, number one for freshman of the year. Um, but like his swing is just like early slot and it's like if you watch it from this angle like it's like the bat doesn't move to here until it's like here and it just like explodes um i yeah i'm i'm really looking forward to watching him some more so explain explain um on plane and i don't want to get too like geeky on um this podcast but explain on plane because a lot of guys probably have a little bit of misconception on what a good number is that they need to be be hitting i know that there's a some of our players that constantly look at that number um could you explain on plane yeah i mean on plane is basically you're just consistently meeting the in, the plan of the incoming pitch so it's not measured from like here to here it's measured when you make contact and then like the algorithm calculates it backwards so like were you able to stay on plane but then you want to look at on so it's 70 percent is the goal like and higher um sometimes the guys are like 98 if you ever see a guy like 95 percent on plane um he could probably like he's probably like almost two on plane and you could probably sacrifice a little bit less but that's near here or there um but the goal is always above 70 percent but it's just being able to uh meet the incoming pitch uh so it's basically the ball is being squared up easily 
your chances of hitting a baseball is or softball it has increased, so more than likely you are going to reach on base. Percentage of contact goes up if you're if you're uh, on plane is seventy percent or higher. Higher on plane, the higher percentage of contact. Again, that's dependent on your bat speed, like right. You know, you still got to have bat speed, so you can be on plane, but you're just like late. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. Like, your average on plane could be good, but if your average bat speed is not great, like you're gonna get blown up at the next level. So, um, but yeah, the, that's where like we had a huge data set from Cape Cod for like a two year data set and the guys with the highest batting average had the highest on play. Um so that was like really cool to see. It kind of validated that. And that's a hard place to hit, as everyone knows. So um and then like other but other metrics that kind of play in the on plane are definitely like early connection. Like if you get early if you get as close to 90 degrees as possible, again like it's really hard to be 90 degrees over and over again. So like we kind of like range it out a little bit. Like 85 what's like, the goal of that connection? So like if you get connected at 90 degrees early, what, it, what's the result usually like what, it, what are the benefits of being connected at 90 degrees on planes, usually above 70%. So you just have a higher, you're getting yourself in an advantageous position to like have that bat be on plane. It's hard so to it's be on plane. Swing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, it's really hard to be on plane. If like your bats being straight up and then you're going like straight down on the ball, it's just hard to consistently like meet the incoming plane in the pitch. So um, yeah, whenever like you're not, if you're not like, if you're on plane, isn't where it needs to be. Like I look at on, I would look at uh, early connection for sure. And so it's just, it makes it a clean, it's a, it's a cleaner move towards the ball. That's probably the best way to describe it. Yeah. Alex, Alex Bregman, when he does the, early slot before he swings, he's kind of like here and he slots and then he swings. That's yep. just, I mean, he's, he's getting his on plane dialed. He's getting his early connection dialed. And then I would assume his on plane is very, very uh, advantageous there too. So, uh, I mean, early connection and connection impact are cool metrics to look at uh, for from a development standpoint and also for a little bit from the evaluation standpoint. So if you have a kid who has really just not in, again, like we usually see high school kids with bad early connection. Because everyone's like was originally taught this, so like Go down. It, yeah, it, exactly. just, everyone who's listening to the audio version, Joe literally just went chopping wood. Let's just chop the hell out of that ball. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I am. I am literally chopping across my chest right now. So, um, yeah, we see like it, it just happens. Like, and literally, some coach just like wants to make it easier for the kid, just swing straight down. So, which make which makes sense because you're trying to get contact. You're trying to get contact like, again understand there is there there's context behind this conversation if we are talking about high school players the conversation is totally different if we're talking with youth players we're just trying to get you to get contact because we want you to enjoy the game we want you to adopt the game uh we're trying to figure everything out and throw in the kitchen sink at you to make sure that you're able to make contact and solid contact there should be like a t-ball coach or like a lily coach who just makes everyone hit like rod carew just has the bat already (laughs) on plane like Rod yes. his bat like stayed on plane from like the time he stepped in the box until he swung. Like his early connection just literally stayed at ninety degrees. So maybe literally coaches out there maybe think about doing that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's in high school. It's a really we see it all the time. High high early connection and on planes like fifty percent. But this is where like it gets interesting. If their if their connection and impact is around ninety degrees that kid probably has some intangibles there where he is constantly able to be in a strong position to hit the baseball, which is like, Oh, this kid has like, this kid is, this kid has some intent, but he, he there's some improvements to this kid. So, um, it, it, it adds to the ceiling. Cause that's an easy thing to fix is like early connection. Just get that kid to slot earlier. And then if a kid, if, so, you know what I mean? Like if you can, if a kid has a bad setup, but he's still able to get in a strong position at 90 degrees at a connection impact, and for those who are like listening, it's 90 degrees from like the barrel to my core. Um, mm. That kid has some intangibles there where he's just able to find the sweet spot of the barrel over and over again. Um, so he that could be a kid who's just hitting really hard, like five foot line drives over and over again. But if he's like, if he fixes that early connection and is on plane improves, then those, those, uh, connect those swings at connection are going to turn to like 20 foot line drives. And that's kind of what you want to kind of go all over the place. We see that a lot. I mean, there's, there is one uh, player. I won't say who he is. He was a first round pick last year. He has some issues with on plane and early connection, but he, I mean, he has just his intangible ability to make contact even at 90 degrees all the time. Um, 
he always hit like hard line drives kind of low wasn't a big power hitter in high school people still like him he's a lefty he's making some improvements right now and is in the major league organization he's in and his rotational acceleration is going up because he's doing less this and his on plane has gotten better and he almost hit a home run the other day in spring training um but that's the type of thing like you kind of see is like though that like yes this is all messed up but that's where you don't like want to throw out that player it's like no he's doing you want to still look for the things he's doing right and get the other thing yeah. to match it. You know what I mean? So it's kind of looking for those strengths and then not really weaknesses, but like improvements. But that's, so a, found, that's a I very found... common case. That's a very common case. Yeah. So I find that connection is like the most confusing thing for a lot of people. And it, it, this leads into a really good question for you is where, where's the starting point for a person to where they can adopt data um, at a small level and then kind of grow into the conversation that we're having right now where we're able to talk in a specific language and know exactly what we're talking about and really realizing, oh, that player is really good because he has these different types of numbers, which I think is a very good language to have because it's black and white. It's not gray. I'm not trust. It's not, it's not opinion. It's fact. So like data collection is very broad, right? Like everything is specific, can be counted as data as long as it's collecting information. Writing everything down is the best start. Like everything, hours of sleep, how much, I, how long I took BP today, uh, what about what did I eat that day? And then like grading yourself, like find a system where you can grade how your body felt during practice, how you felt during the night, or how you felt before you went to bed, and how you uh, felt when you woke up, which is probably super important. Cause so. That's the biggest thing is like, I would just create like an Excel sheet and I'm sure there's like an app out there that helps you do this and just document like everything you do. And then you can kind of correlate, like that's data collection. That really is diving into data is under like finding correlation. You can do that for free. You can do it for free. Excel's free. Um, <laughs> I guess it's kind of free, um, but, yeah. or carry a notebook with you. I mean, my, my girlfriend does that. She carries a notebook with her and writes on everything she eats and when she works out and everything. And, um, she said she's a better data scientist than I'll ever be. And she works in production, but, uh, so, but that is like the best start you could have, like is writing everything down. Cause a player who has that kind of type of skill set and they're developing that type of skill set, that's the player who like, when he gets exposed is ex exposed to like technology side of data, it can just like consume it a little easier. Um, but that's really mm -hmm. what starts is just writing everything down. I can't, I just can't stress that enough. It's just, you know, it's like when you get, when you use tech and, uh, do all these new things they don't like know historical backgrounds on you like i can't like a blast motion doesn't like can't tell you what you look like the night before mm -hmm. or what you did the night before like you got i i just say like writing things down is probably the biggest one it's always it's always learning right always being willing to learn and being able to slowly consume like oh connection means this or then buying a whoop strap or buying a blast motion sensor. Don't buy a don't you don't need to buy a rap soto device that's super expensive for you, but a club could probably have that and you're able to start gathering data there. But I think that's a very solid point on just literally write it down. Just need to get a notebook. I would focus on process oriented metrics, which is lucky that's where blast kind of lands in. It's like anything that's not like result driven. Like you no know, like exit view is a, a result launch angles are a result stats are a result um but like the so process runs, doubles, metrics, those are all results those yeah. are all results it's really hard to focus on those things because like they're just outcomes so like i would find find like more process oriented metrics of those outcomes so like for pitching which means nutrition like nutrition sleep and like for performance like you know spin rate for pitchers you know rotational acceleration for hitters on blast, um, on plan, you know, anything that's like more process oriented, it's just like telling you a story of what's happening there. Um, I think it's super important. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can, there, and there's like examples of these things like everywhere. Like I've got super into like uh, philosophy in this past year where I'm like reading a bunch of philosophy books. And um, mm -hmm. it was, I was reading this interpretation and this is gonna sound like super religion-y, but like I'm just, it's an example, but it's an Aristotle example. So I, had, I, I was reading this interpretation of Aristotle of like God. And I guess Aristotle's interpretation of God is the ultimate voice of reason. So, mm -hmm. but there's no exact reason. The closest you can be to God is if you're constantly searching for reason. So you're constantly searching, on, you're constantly on that process. 
knowing you're never going to find the exact answer. To, but the point is you're continually, you're continuously trying to find the answer. So you're all, you're doing yourself um, a favor and I guess God a favor by um, yeah. constantly asking why, how, and when, and then you. That's such important. That's answer. so important. That yeah, so I read, important. I read that. I was like, Aristotle could have ran a major league anal analytics department. <laughs> 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 like, yeah, uh, I was like, this is great. <laughs> I, I just think every, every, every good person that is, um, that I respect, it seems the underlying factor is that they're constantly always trying to learn. They're willing to engulf information, whether that's audio, video, um, written word. I'm a big fan of written word because I, I know how hard that is to develop. I think it's way harder to write a book than to create a video or create audio. I just, I think it's the gold standard of content, but it, it, it's true. It's, you always have to be searching for reasoning, always searching for, for answers to your questions, which is the main, main questions that you ask, which is the who, what, where, and why. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And just like being able to scale. And then once you like, when you're collecting information and be able to scale the communication of different things, like, you know, you got this podcast, you have Twitter, there's like blogs, you just, you know, you can, you can to uh, distribute these disinformation like different verticals. I think that's like really important for people. Um, you know, like e even like, you know, some of these like blog posts are really um, like, I think dry line has great blog posts and like really mm -hmm. in depth research. And sometimes I do this, sometimes I don't, but like, I like whenever there's a blog post on something that's very like in, like in depth, I have all the, I have all the evidence-based knowledge in there and everything, but I would like a, um, and I did this with my PBR uh, uh, article I wrote, but then like a thread on just like the takeaways. Cause not everyone's gonna have time to read a full blog and like, you know, you hope everyone reads what you write, but like, just like, you know, like putting up a thread on like the takeaways. So there's another way to kind of distribute that information. And then we have like this podcast here and stuff like that. Like, yeah. I think it's really important to find different ways to communicate uh, what we're learning to people too. So no, it's cool. What's Get, give a because I want to start wrapping up the conversation because um, we are literally at the 90 minute mark, <laughs> uh, which I, I mean, again, we could probably talk for another two hours, to be honest with you. Um, what what influencers do you follow that you that you validate? Like you're like, man, this guy is this guy or this gal is really on point. They're not spamming the feed. They're literally trying to do their best and researching and finding answers. Who are your big follows? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I got kind of the luxury of like being close to people at Blast who are just phenomenal thinkers. And I mean, they're like Jacob Howenstein, we showed his tweet, like he's brilliant. Like he really is. And I get to learn a lot from him and bug him a lot and slack him mm -hmm. out. I used to just like stand at his desk and his headphones and just like tap him <laughs> questions. Um, and then Kyle Adel is like one of the best communicators I've ever met. And like those two guys work hand in hand on the MLB side. And I've got to learn a lot from those guys. So like, but, and then you know, we have other people who are really good communicators. Like John Moscott's a terrific communicator. Cause like Moscott, you know, came in and then you can learn a lot from someone who's learning too. Like Moscott kind of like openly learns inside of blast, right? So then like mm -hmm. you're picking up things that he's learning that you probably should have learned along the way as well. So I got, I am pretty lucky with like the people inside of blast I get to learn from. Um, but as for like, like influencers on the Twitter space, I mean, everyone from driveline is great. Um, mm -hmm. honestly, but I agree. I do like to try and follow people outside the baseball space to kind of understand like how they're doing things. Um, mm -hmm. so especially like on the evaluation side, um, there's a, a, a professor and what he's the Dean of Valuation at NYU, Aswaf, uh, Oswaf Damadorian. Um, he is an exceptional like thinker and communicator on, and on how his process and how he uh, values companies. And he, it, he throws away the jargon and he keeps it super simple. And he kind of reminds you that like even, you know, data and numbers can be manipulated a little bit. Like they can have biases on there as well um like companies can have like biased stats and numbers on there so he's like and he has a book i would recommend to anyone who is interested in like value in like evaluating anything it's called narrative and numbers which is and he kind of teaches the way to tell a story with uh with the numbers at the side and he admits that 
the storytellers, the companies who are great storytellers like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, like those guys are going to always draw in a large audience. And they're going to draw in a large, and it's called like free capital, pretty much. Like people mm-hmm. are just going to continue to invest in those guys because those guys' vision is incredible. They can get people on the same page. But then if you have the people who can use the narrative and their storytelling with numbers, um, then you have like a home run. Like you have guys who can like, I mean, you're really articulating a cool vision there. And that's kind of like, like scouts, like the, I kind of look at scouts as like the narrative, what they're seeing, um, you know, floor, ceiling, good movements, good shoulders, all that. And then being able to articulate that with like data, with like spin rate or bad speed, rotational acceleration, all that. And I think we're going to get to a point where like a lot, I'm sure there, there already is, but probably not like, speaking about as much, but like people who can like tell the story with the numbers and the data or be able to tell what they're scouting or what they what they saw from when they scouted and tell it with the data. I think that's going to be like, that's a huge advantage in today's world for sure. Cause like we talked about earlier, there's so much like blanket statements, like, and like the term analytics is such a blanket statement. Um, and I think people like aren't, sometimes people aren't like asking why enough like i would love to see someone on mlb network just ask why are they doing that once in a while instead of just like taking like the orioles use data cool and then they move on it's like well how <laughs> I was like, accept, love. Just accept the fact. yeah they, it's just accepting it and i think it's because people like don't haven't really investigated enough like what that actually means they just know they have to know what it means so like it's like an insecurity of like just like pretending you know what somebody means like i think i think the like, I always love the person who just says, like, I have no idea. Like, I don't know what that, I don't know what that means. Please tell me. Like, that person probably, like, it, that's the person who, like, learns the most, can contain the most knowledge, and then finds ways to, like, communicate it. Um, that's, I mean, th- those are the type of influences I really look at. And I will say, just because it actually, believe it or not, this kind of, like, is very similar to the baseball space. Um, Ian Borthwick, he is, he ran influencer marketing for um, SeatGeek for a while and he mm. went through how he he evaluates uh potential influencers and it was like so similar to how you would evaluate a baseball player it was like the intangibles the likability and all that um but then when he's diving into like the data and the and the um the analytics side of evaluating a influencer is like you kind of it's kind of like batting average like how we look at batting average now it's kind of like mm. a vanity metric almost that's what like how they look at followers. So like he says like they try they, they try to use data points that show like the authority of someone's voice. And like that's oh, wow. how brands that's how brands should use uh social media metrics and that's how influencers should use it. So like uh average engagement rate, um, and then like uh what was the other one? There's like like organic mentions, like someone mm-hmm. who organically mentions your account over and over again. And whenever you say something on Twitter or put someone out there on Instagram, whatever, the amount of people who like act, not just like it, but like engage with it, click through it. And then like that person can sell products for you. And that person is like a brand. So I was Does like, a book out? is it, is it a book or is it a blog? Like, or, or is it just a follow? Like you follow him on Twitter? Well, I follow, I follow him on Twitter and he spits out a bunch of information. He just started his own mm. podcast now because he's just like vomiting all this information. I first listened to him. Uh, I don't know if you listen. Do you listen to any of the Morning Brew stuff? I've listened to one episode. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't dived deep, deep into it. He went on one of them, and it was really good. But uh, he spits out a bunch of really cool information on top of like certain campaigns, and he gotcha. got like real. He got pretty big because he was uh, the David Dobrak guy. Like, he was one who got David Dobrak into like um, the C. Like, C Geeks everywhere. They're with Barstool. They're with. I mean, he just found a way to. Uh, kind of lean into like the creators and well he got all the big creators at the in that 20 it was like 2012 2015 range like he he got casey neistat he got david dobrik like he just started i think he got liza as well just started nailing out these big influencers that everyone like wakes up they're like oh influencer marketing actually works yeah no and he talks about like the history of it too and it's just like the struggles he had early on and like learning about it like it's pretty similar to how like we were learning about how to evaluate baseball players a little bit. Like there was like a thing that's always been done, which is like pay this guy to say this thing on air. And like, sometimes that just doesn't work. Like now more because like kids like grow up on the internet so they can just like smell BS from a mile away when they're being sold. Um, they like transparency. So you started like leaning into creators and like using these metrics to find out who had a strong authority of voice and then just like 
crushed it for CP. But yeah, so those are like some of the type of the guys I like to listen to or read and listen to outside of baseball. Also, Oswald Damadorian puts his whole his whole curriculum for free on on his website. They, NYU is like oh no way, that. yeah. They, they just like like he says he videotapes all his classes. Uh, he writes these like valuation posts on certain. He'll pick like three companies. He'll start evaluating for that year. Um, it's really cool, and he has some interviews on podcasts. Like he has a Google Talk that's really good on YouTube. I highly recommend that. Um, how do you do? You know how to spell his name, or is that just a is he like Russian or something, or is he? No, he's uh, from India. I have one of his books. Okay. Yeah, Aswath is you know his Aswath is A S W A T H, and then Damodaran is D A M O D A R A N. Um, got it. Has, yeah, he's got some really cool stuff. Um, and then um, baseball wise too, like I really like Max Gordon over at Driveline. He's 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 a really good communicator. Of course, Kyle Bodie. I mean, Kyle Bodie mm-hmm. seems like he's turning into like the uh, he's like the Jeff Bezos of like the baseball industry. He definitely is. I mean, he is. He, he focuses on systems and automation and, and just improving everyone's like like what they're trying to do at driveline. They're trying to they're just trying to like be like whatever you're trying to do development wise. Like they want people to use driveline to be able to scale that. And they're scaling their information. It's out there. A lot of it's for free and then they have some pretty cool they're, they're providing a great service too i would say that they're probably one of the main catalysts of where we are in the baseball space like they they're they are the ogs um when it comes to being able to give out great data and great information and um it can be over your over some people's heads but it is good to dive into their their stuff because they do talk in layman's terms um quite often yeah, and I'm actually I'm pretty excited to see what uh, Trevor Bauer ends up doing too with his media companies and yeah, you know he he's more he is probably a little more focused on. I mean, he was he was doing a lot of stuff before Driveline was doing that he kind of shared with them, but he didn't have like systems in place to like scale out that information. So I, I and he he has a the people he works with over over there too like Tosh Sem, uh, Semclair. I don't know if I said his name right. Uh, I got to know him over at the PBR Super 60 last year when he was at Driveline. He's now working at Momentum. Um, I think they're going to be able I think they're going to create some pretty cool like systems in place for development. I'm kind of curious to see what they're mm-hmm. going to do, but they're very media focused and distribution focused. And Tosh is super sharp, very sharp, really good communicator. He had a really good um, presentation at the PBR Super 60 last year. Um, but I also, I've heard stories like Trevor Bauer, uh, like these players were like DMing him, like minor leaguers are DMing him, like asking him for like tips on curveball or sliders or whatever. Um, and he would like answer it. He like do his Zoom calls with these guys behind the scenes and like kind of help them development wise. And at some point, you know, that's not like, it's so cool, but I think he wants to scale that. And he's been pretty like, I like the whole, like I want to take two year deals or whatever, four year deals, I guess now and go to different organizations and kind of like influence it. Cause I think he has a bigger picture on building something that's more around like, you know, the media side, development side. I don't know. He's taking the Taylor Swift model. He really is. He's taking the Taylor Swift model, which is uh, make myself accessible and being able to provide back to the game, which is pretty neat. Yeah. He's got that LeBron thing going on too. Like LeBron's umbrella. LeBron's like probably one of the best job creators in the country. (laughs) (laughs) That guy creates so many jobs through like commercial. I mean, he's got uh, Spring Hill is his, is his production company. Um, mm-hmm. He's got un, undefeated for distribution. Uh, Clutch Sports is now with UTA, so now they have talent for, for they, now they have access to talent for both sports and for actors. Um, and then they have a, a deal with like Live Nation. Like they have a huge umbrella, and they just like spit out jobs and production and content. And, like mm-hmm. like he's probably he's probably produced more jobs out here in LA than like. I don't know any politician has. Um, that's something I think. Yeah. I, I think that's what Trevor Trevor's probably going to try and do on the baseball side. Um, different people, but like same similar models. It looks like. Yeah. No, I love it, um, Joe. This has been an unbelievable conversation, um, and we got to have to we have to do this again at some point because um, the conversation could end up taking a whole different spin. It might We might have to have you on the Closing Pitch podcast because um, then we can start talking about culture, leadership, and um, all the intangibles, soft skills. Dude, absolutely. Would you guys, <laughs> hey, I, want, I want to do a podcast over at Blast. Would you guys, would, would people be interested in a Blast podcast? 
Like, yeah, I think I think from an analytical standpoint, yes. Like driveline, this is what's interesting about driveline. And I was a, I was a little disappointed. This is the only knock that I have on them is that they had a really strong following on their podcast and they stopped doing it. It was like literally there that literally was like a microsecond and it was I think they used it to help promote the driveline hitting when they first started doing the hitting and really trying to promote that. And it was great information and it was conversations that were very unique. Like Kyle went down the route of talking about retirement, which is huge. No, no athlete um, was talking about that. Like an athletic business was talking about that. And those are the things that athletes need to hear because they are so focused in on their craft, which is correct. They need to do that. But having have it talk using the medium of sports and then being able to relate it back to philosophy or relating it to leadership or relating it to finance, business, marketing, influence. I think that's so valuable. And that's, and I'm gonna be honest, that's one of the reasons why I started a podcast was after listening to Bodie talk and then following the other guys that I follow outside of our industry, I was like, this is something I want to do. It just made sense. No, I, I used to, I, I used to listen to that podcast all the time. Just hearing him like just go off for an hour on my way to work was awesome. Um, yes. I think it's just because they, they all got jobs. <laughs> like everyone got different. Like they're all like like Major League Baseball organizations are just like grabbing these guys left and right. Um, they're but their research and development podcast is pretty good. I don't know if you heard mm-hmm. that one. It's called like Drilling. No, I have not. It's good. Not. It's good. It, it, the episodes are usually pretty long, and they're usually just like. It's almost seems like a meeting, but they're all like drink, drinking IPAs during it. <laughs> are they still? Are, so it's it's most recent content. Like they're creating still. Yeah, no, I, I've subscribed to them. They, I keep seeing new episodes pop up. Um, okay, pretty much cool. they just like talk about what they worked on the last like two weeks and what they found and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. Um, gotcha. But yeah, I'm kind of like here. Like I almost want to do like a podcast of like yeah, we do like like internal internal. We have so much intelligent people internally. I'd like to like other people are here to speak and then like bring in like you, someone like you or a mm-hmm. conference coach and some of the PBR guys and just kind of like finding new ways to educate people on blast. I think it'd be kind of cool. So I'm going to have to hit you up for sure how to do it. There it is. <laughs> All right, Joe, I appreciate it, man. Um, we'll, we'll catch you later and I'll get you back on the podcast again shortly. Sounds good. Man. Appreciate it.